Sure. Are we going? Oh, we are failing to Facebook. I'm doing my own IT because this is Saturday, and I think making my staff work is is um, unfair. So I'll I'll switch over in a second. And go to Facebook Live. I'm Mayor Beatty. I am the 34th Mayor of Beaverton. I'm the first woman to serve in this role. I have a, a really rambunctious three year old. You'll probably hear she's dressed like Catboy today. Also been dressed like Catboy for six days straight. Can't peel it off of her. Um, she'll only answer me if I call her Catboy. So if you hear it, don't think it's weird. This is a town hall about child care and the gaps. So there we go. Um, thank you for having us, Rep Dexter, and of course, Commissioner Fi, one of my fellow Beaverton electeds and fellow mother. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Mayor Beatty, and good morning, everyone. And thank you so much, um, Maxine, for including us in this. And I'm really excited to uh, talk about this conversation, you know, to participate in this conversation and to really have a, a robust dialogue around childcare and how we can really resolve this. And, you know, especially now that we're thinking about, you know, going back, whatever back means <laughs> uh, to the workforce and how we're going to recover our economic, um, you know, for Washington County being the economic engine of Oregon. So, so I'm really excited and thank you for having us. And I want to say hi to and congratulations to Alfredo, who's in the room, who won on Tuesday. Congratulations, Alfredo Moreno, with the uh, THBRD Board of Directors. Actually, uh, yeah, Alfredo, you've got it. You're on it. All and right. I also see I think Sharon Harrington is also in the um, in the audience. Hello, Chair. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. All right, I think, am I uh, running next? Am I teeing up this, the problem here? So, well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us for this town hall. We're gonna go over a couple topics today, one of which is going to be um, childcare and one of which is housing. And then we're gonna do potentially at the end, a little round robin conversation about ARPA money and how local governments and everyone kind of work together to get that out. So I see childcare as a plethora of issues, right? We have um, here at the local level, I've been working with um, local providers. I did a, a meet and greet with the mayor with local childcare providers not that long ago to talk about some of the problems that it takes to open up in-home daycare. We know in Beaverton in particular, there's massive childcare deserts. There's not a lot of places for young people to go. As a mom of a toddler, I was waitlisted in like eight different places for my child. And so, you know, one of the things that I think we need to address is the certification for in-home daycare. When the pandemic hit and we started closing big facilities and tried to pivot to this kind of work from home model, and a lot of women were exited out of the workforce that were looking for true work from home opportunities, not like commission based multi level marketing, but like, how do I actually get a paycheck in the door. And we didn't adjust as government fast enough to allow the regulations for them to actually do that. And so what we saw was a bunch of illegal in home daycares because people still needed their kids cared for. It was happening and there's no regulation and oversight of it. So from my seat, that's a huge piece of the problem. And then the second piece is affordability, right? How do we afford, you know, for, for my one kid, it's over $1,000 a month. And like how much, like that's more than it cost me to go to college. And so when we're thinking about how do parents make it, how do we make childcare necessity? You know, one of the things that I'm, I'm excited to work on with some of my peers is, is the prospect of um, preschool for all. So at least it eliminates a year of childcare expenses. So I think that's where we're at in government. We haven't really adapted to what our community needs us to do, which is most two dual working income families need a place for their child to go that they can afford for them to be there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mayor Beatty. And I am so sorry. I'm just going to give you all the um, the heads up that I am on service in the ICU at um, Westside in Hillsboro right now, and um, things are under control, but I am going to get phone calls. So I apologize for that. Um, and I, uh, Commissioner Fye, if you don't mind kind of following up on that, I'm going to be off camera for just a minute. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll certainly um, drill down to Washington County and I do wanna um, also create the opportunity for um, 
this is an issue for our chair and uh, something that she really championed and try to get some more dollars. But in terms of Washington County, Washington County received the federal aid through the Coronavirus Relief and Economic Security Act, um, also known as the CARES Act. Um, Washington County does not provide childcare to employees. However, um, Washington County Board of Commissioners recognize that many smaller um, um, childcare providers might struggle to comply with new operational requirements and would you know, um, um, uh, would and then would face some struggle um, and would lose uh, due to uh, uh, some losses due to uh, pandemic. And given that the county has, you know, already ha uh, has a store, a, you know, a shortage of childcare facilities, uh, the commissioners determined. This is before um, my time and when I was running. Uh, the commissioners determined that childcare was a vital resource um, in, um, that consisted of essential workers. And if childcare providers were to close down, uh, the losses caused by the pandemic would exacerbate the current and, and also the current shortage and hammer the future economic recovery. Um, with that being said, Washington County, in partnership with MISO, uh, invested. Um, 5.5 million. Uh, I was actually surprised at that. I thought it was smaller. So it's, a, it's actually a good news, 5.5 million for childcare provider support. And, and while I might not have the comprehensive priorities, but I wanna highlight key areas that was uh, prioritized in this funding. Uh, childcare providers with smaller operating capacities and budget was a top priority. Uh, and then uh, uh, providing care for underserved families was a, uh, another priority. And then lastly, you know, uh, and ultimately um, keeping childcare facilities open was the top priority. And for uh, childcare facilities in Washington County, in order to qualify some of that funding, uh, what the county uh, put together around uh, criteria and requirements was you know, you first you obviously have to be located in Washington County to continue to serve uh, the workforce in Washington County and the families in Washington County. And then also, you know, have an active childcare provider license. Uh, and then the other uh, criteria that was required, um, uh, which I was really happy about because especially uh, other child cares who are smaller or operate smaller uh, facilities, uh, the re one of the requirement was uh, no more than 15 employees. Um, so if you had more than 15 employees to be considered larger. And then uh, there was a annual a revenue requirement of under $500,000 in 2019 uh, taxes. Um, so that was the, the, the requirement, um, not too strict, um, but also uh, uh, measurable uh, requirements. And then uh, the, res the results of that funding was, you know, 318 grants. And, and then uh, out of that, 292 were awarded. So the, uh, out of that 318 grants, uh, 292 became a grantees. And what that, in terms of dollars, what that translated was 3 point, um, almost 2 million in awarded funds. Um, so that was what was done. And in terms of in the future, we're, we're engaging that conversation to really have that, you know, meaningful uh, conversation around, we did that, uh, how can we beef up and, and really uh, uh, magnify that support for uh, our, our families in, in uh, Washington County. Um, so. Any questions uh, that, you know, if you have any questions, uh, I think uh, audience can submit, right, uh, Mayor Beatty? Um, and if not, I think I turn it back to uh, Representative Dexter. Thank you, yeah, and I really appreciate, I, I would love for this to be um, interactive. Like, I think we have an amazing group of people here with um, THPRD and our chair of Washington County and, and our other county, Lori, our, County Commissioner, and you're in Eugene, right? I'm sorry, I know I should know that, Lori. Um, but uh, with Courtney Helstein and everyone, like we have an amazing um, reservoir of, or mine bank here. And so I think what I would really like to do is 
um, popcorn some questions if anyone has any or just jump in quite frankly and what I'll just kind of do quickly is overview what my thoughts are um, at the state level I am not I serve on the healthcare and the judiciary subcommittee, so I'm not on the early childhood committee, but this is an area that I'm really committed um, to leaning into and making sure that we make um, statewide infrastructural shifts so that we can co collaborate and coordinate much more effectively with our local leaders and, and partners. What I see um, and I know is part of um, our endeavor is to create an overarching um, early childhood um and and courtney please remind me of the bill number and and the official term for it but um basically one agency that's going to coordinate um child care supports at the state level and current power is the leader on that courtney what's the bill number i'm sorry uh house bill 3073 Thank you. I, I was looking madly in my notes for it. And unfortunately, the the morning has thrown me off a little bit from my game. So, um, so we will, at the state level, hopefully be able to create a, a framework that we can get the resources where we need and, and integrate the services that really need to be integrated so that we can fulfill our desperate need to um, facilitate childcare um, opening as well as um, licensing and um, funding um, at the state level. And Courtney, if you'll just kind of give a better evaluation because I know I'm, I'm not gonna give it the justice that you will. No problem, happy to jump in. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Courtney Helstein. I'm the political director for Family Forward Oregon. And we're an organization that advocates um, on behalf of mothers and caregivers and as well as families in general in the workforce. And so obviously we care a lot about child care. Um, uh, and our kind of top priority this legislative session, um, as Representative Dexter mentioned, is House Bill 3073. And it will do two things. So one, um, it will actually unify all of our early learning and child care subsidy programs in the state under one new agency called the Department of Early Learning and Care. Uh, and right now, all of our early learning um, uh, programs and then our largest child care subsidy program are actually held in two separate agencies, but they're actually funded out of the same pot of money. Um, so parents, providers, um, oftentimes they use um, programs like Preschool Promise or Baby Promise the same time that they qualify for employment related daycare that's housed in a different agency. And so providers, parents, they have to go through two processes, through two different agencies, through two different application processes to apply for programs that are funded with the same amount of money that are being controlled and operated in two different agencies. So it creates a lot of redundancies and it creates a lot of confusion um, uh, for uh, parents and childcare providers. Um, the second thing that it'll do um, uh, is that um, it will actually reform our state's largest child care um, subsidy program, the employment related daycare program, uh, so that it actually works better um, for uh, parents and providers who are part of the program. It'll cap co-pays um, for parents uh, at 7% of a parent's income. Right now, um, uh, on employment related daycare, these are some of our, these are like our poorest families, our most vulnerable families in the state. Uh, we're being asked to pay upwards of 30% of their monthly income uh, um, on their childcare co pays. Um, it will also expand um, uh, eligibility uh, for undocumented children. Um, it will uh, ensure that once a family qualifies, uh, they qualify for, for the subsidy for at least 12 months. Um, I, keeping that continuity of care um, for the child, which is super important, and also financial stability for the child care providers who are part of the program. Um, and it will also um, help move our states, like how we actually pay providers um, from a percentage of the market rate um, to the actual true cost of care. So we can start to um, help things like that with like wages, benefits. Um, we can help reduce uh, turnover. Um, uh, and just help the overall kind of well-being of child care providers who do the important work. 
and it'll also pay our child care providers, require that our child care providers are paid based off of um, enrollment as opposed to attendance. Just like private pay families are expected to do, just like we pay our educators in our K through 12 system. So um, th uh, this is, uh, um, I, it would be, it's a huge undertaking, but it's really exciting. Right now, the bill has bipartisan, bicameral support. It's waiting in ways and means. Um, I'll drop a link in the chat if you want to uh, contact your lawmaker <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, to support uh, to support the bill. And um, your uh, your email of support will also go to um, House and Senate leadership as well as uh, members of the Ways and Means Committee who. Uh, now uh, we need to make sure to shore up so that they use all this awesome federal money that we've got, <laughs> $404 million from the federal government just for child care um, uh, to really go big and start to um, fundamentally transform uh, and help us build ultimately uh, towards a universal child care system. Thank you so much, Courtney. And I think that I am most interested in hearing, um, you know, from Mayor Beatty and Commissioner Fai, and as well as uh, Chair Harrington, what are the things that I can do at the state level, aside from advocating for this amazing bill, which I, I really do believe we have got to um, clear as many silos as we can and make sure that we are aligning our resources um, behind the need that we so desperately see in our communities to get um, families stabilized so that everyone can participate in the economy um, equitably. So um, please jump in, let me know um, where you see the needs from the state level for legislation needs. Um, my guess is there are some things in, in action that I can help lean into that um, Courtney can help me also make sure that I'm doing. But the big picture is um, I have two thirds of my district is in unincorporated Washington County. And so um, we need to make sure that those resources are available, not just to the folks who are within city limits. And, and this is an issue with um, preschool for all in Portland um, or in the Multnomah County, people are paying for it. If they work in Multnomah County, which many of the Beaverton or um, Washington County residents are, and yet they don't have access um, to those um, preschool services. Um, and I see that as a, a challenge in inequity too that I'd love to touch on too. So um, let's go ahead and I'll just open it up and have people jump in if you will. And Alfredo also because of what THPRD is doing um, to help support childcare, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. No pressure, Alfredo, right in the gate. You thought you'd be watching, now you're participating. You don't um, have to, <laughs> you get a bypass if you'd like. Oh no, he doesn't get a pass. He'll be in. We coached him well. Um, I, you know, for me, there's a couple of structural issues. There's all of the stuff that Courtney is talking about, and all of that is amazing, right? We see massive turnover because of pay and equity and all of those things. From the city side and from like the more the business side, it's access to capital for expansion. I met with tons of childcare providers that were uh, willing and able to expand. They had the staff, they had the resources, but they couldn't access the capital they needed because commercial loans are so different, right? And so how do we create either through like a state loan or a state backed bond or something of that nature where people could actually access this specific capital for the expansion of child care services, because it is a huge hurdle if you don't have the best economic background or you don't have enough personal assets to bond against or you're maybe new to this country. And if we want to have culturally competent care, we need to look at the way that our lending laws are impacting people's ability to expand, which is totally different than the service side that a lot of the stuff we've been talking about but it's really practical because we could have all the people in the world primed up, ready to go, paid in a fair amount and educated till kingdom come. If there's no physical location for people to go, that is a huge barrier. And the other thing it's in, in what I mentioned in the setup of this conversation is the streamlined aspect of getting a business license, getting licensed, what they're doing. Can we look at that process and figure out a way to make it easier to understand and knowing we have to inspect what we expect and what people are doing 
training. We're going to send people back out, but can we do some one day crash courses? You want to open up a child care daycare. Here's your packet of information. Here's your buddy. And here is a business person like concierge service, someone at the state that they could particularly work with to work through the problems. Because if your English is a second language, new to this country, those are huge bureaucratic barriers that are stopping the expansion of physical daycare facilities. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah go and, ahead, Mr. Fai, sorry. Yeah, no, I, I, you posed a really good question, um, Representative Dexter, and I really appreciate you asking that directly. And I think for me, I'll also, you know, uh, create the opportunity for our chair to go on camera and to say a few words to you specifically, because I know this is an, uh, a close issue that she championed. Um, and so what I wanna, um, if I could ask my, if I could put my ask to you, you know, I think it's really important whatever bill is out there and, and that we're advocating uh, that we also uh, talk about meaningful me uh, funding mechanism, you know, for that bill, where that money is going to go, and to specifically call out to communities that have been left behind, and to build into that structure of the mechanism, and and to say, you know, you're real. This is how we're going to do, and these are the community how we're going to funnel money to the communities. And then I also think it's important the state legislator to think about, you know. Who's considered, and I don't know, I don't mean who by like a person, but what types of business is considered a childcare? Uh, a lot of communities of color, low-income communities, use friends and family, and uh, the definition, um, you know, when you're applying for grants and who's qualified, is a type of specific business licensing uh, that you know, leaves you out of a lot of funding and grants opportunities. So I really think if we're going to be, you know, facilitating an equitable um, diffusion of money and fundings, I, I really think it's important that we expand that definitions and include, you know, not only in-home daycare, but those uh, non-traditional child carers uh, that have been used for centuries and, and will continue to be operating you know, a lot of communities of color and low income communities feel, you know, it's easier to ask me, hey, Nafisa, I don't have a lot of money. Can I pay you $5? Can you watch my child? And we can make the, or I'll watch you, you know, your child today. And can you watch mine make that trade if we don't financially are able in that? But I think uh, as a society, we should be compensating for those families. Uh, and if we're going to uplift people out of poverty, I think. Um, we need to really be cognizant about our definition. And I think that's one thing you can advocate and and then also specifically call out uh, specific uh, um, culturally specific organizations to build into that mechanism where we're building the mechanics of that bill. Um, um, I'm always interested in where the funding is gonna go and if it's, it's gonna keep the status quo going or this money has always been funneled into this or that uh, then that hasn't served us and look where we are. So we have to really uh, think things differently and, and, and uh, try new, you know, um, new ways of recognizing people. I am just so grateful. Add, yeah, please go ahead, Mayor Beatty. I just wanna add to that because we, we faced that problem not too long ago when the county and the school district uh, liberated funds together to roll it out to families uh, that were experiencing having to pay for childcare during the last year. And it could only go to licensed, if you had your kid in a licensed daycare facility, which was just unconscionable when there was very few open and it only allowed those that had privilege to continue to have privilege and didn't compensate for your aunties and your uncles and your grandmas and your mimis and all of those people that stepped up this last year that often left the workforce to do it were unable to be compensated by that fund. And so I think the redefinition that Commissioner Fai is talking about is really, really important. No, that is critical. And I have to um, say that, you know, I had never thought about it. We we pay family members to take care of um, our loved ones in the home when they have medical issues. It's a really interesting. And Courtney um, Helstein, if, if you know of a bill that's like thinking about 
are we looking to reimburse our family members or community members who are doing this critical child care um, for our families? Is there any mechanism for paying them in the same way that we would a home health worker who's a family member or a friend? Yeah, um, we do have a mechanism. Unfortunately, it's very broken <laughs> and it needs a lot of work. Um, so uh, it is actually, they are called friend, family, neighbor providers. Right now they um, are, um, uh, they don't have to be licensed um, or regulated per se, but it is a recognition that for um, folks who qualify for employment related daycare. So of course it's a, it's a specific portion um, of the community um, that uh, they can uh, instead of going to like a licensed or registered um, uh, in-home provider or to a like center-based care, they can um, have a, a friend, family, or neighbor um, that they choose um, be the uh, kind of um, identified caretaker of their child with the state. And then that person will be paid um, uh, through the employment-related daycare subsidy program for the care of that child. Um, so that currently exists right now. Um, I have to say that we don't necessarily need a bill to do this, um, but it, this is like so top priority after this legislative session. It is a absolute nightmare for families to try and navigate the application process of getting this designation to be considered friend, family, neighbor. And then you have to work so hard and go through this super confusing system in order to get it. And then the rates are so low that on average, folks are only getting paid about three and a half dollars per hour per child. That's unacceptable. <laughs> so why would any family member go through all of that when the family member and, and could maybe qualify for ERDC and actually take that cost away from them? No, no family member is going to be able to afford to be able to, to go use that program to, to, um, uh, to, you know, to help their family in that way. So um, there is the, the general infrastructure does exist. Um, and uh, um, however, we have to move the state away from a payment model for providers, whether it's friend, family, neighbor, in-home provider, center-based care, um, right now, the rates are based off um, 70, the um, 75th percentile of the market rate. So not even the full market rate, which we already know. Providers literally actually, like parents actually can't afford the full cost of care. <laughs> and so providers actually can't charge that. <laughs> but it's already really expensive. Um, and so... Um, you know, the rates are just so low. We, we've got to, you know, there has to be some government intervention here um, to help bridge this gap so that we can actually pay, um, uh, pay these providers what they're worth and increase their wages. Um, and that's why in House Bill 3073, it actually directs the state um, to move towards um, a, a true cost of care payment model over a series of time because um, it gets more complicated when we bring in the federal context. Um, the vast majority of the funding that we get for our child care subsidy programs actually comes from the federal government. And the federal government has kind of set out this decree that the payment system will be you know, a, a percentage of the market rate. So as a state, we actually have to apply for a waiver to use a different payment model. So it does take a little bit of time, but we've got the momentum. And as a state, we actually just finished up a work group to actually build a tool, which will help us determine the true cost of care um, for different types of providers and different types of settings um, in different places across the state. So now that we have the tool, um, uh, we're one step closer to kind of figuring out like, okay, what would be um, so what's the difference between what we pay now and then uh, what, uh, how we get to the true cost of care and then hopefully eventually applying for that waiver from the federal government. So we have to get permission from them first before we can 
actually, at least through our child care subsidy programs, actually pay providers um, for the critical work that they do. So luckily we have uh, Congresswoman Bonamici, who I think is fully supportive of all this work. And so we really do have um, an amazing opportunity here to um, try to align all of the will and get it moving where we need it to go. Um, what I can say for certain is we have a women majority for the first time in history in the legislature. I am surrounded by fierce um, and really courageous leaders. And I know that many of us are either current mothers or, or parents, I should say, um, or are you know, in a place where we will be or are in you know, taking care of our um, grandchildren. So we have an amazing opportunity to really um, take a, a position of leadership as a state and we have got to make it culturally competent. And I see a lot of um, comments in the chat about collaborating with the structures that are already there. But I think even more critical is collaborating with the community-based organizations that represent or um, support our uh, marginalized communities, our most at risk, um, you know, the English language learners, um, new, you know, people who are afraid to engage with government um, for a good reason, we need to make sure that we are giving women and their families a chance to participate in the economy in a meaningful way. Um, I am going to uh, ask that we make a decision as a group whether there wants to, we want to do more question and answers. We're at 12.05 and we did want to try to cover housing as well. I don't feel like we've even touched the surface here. So I'm gonna um, defer to the wisdom of my other two co-hosts and I'm gonna answer a page and I'm really sorry, thank you. Uh, I mean, I'm happy to move on to housing. I'm happy to keep chatting. I think uh, we know where some of the structural problems lie with childcare and I think it's political will to fix it. and. Really, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, Commissioner Fye, do you want to keep going on this topic? Uh, no, I agree with you, Mayor. Vin. Let's move on to the next one. I think, um, um, yeah. OK, well, I'll just set the tone for housing while Representative Dexter's off uh, caring for a patient. And then I think we'll try to move through that and leave 10 or 15 minutes at the end to answer some questions. Uh, housing is another massive structural problem that exists. And just to be blunt, it just costs too much to live here, right? The reality is if you work in a city like Beaverton, you should be able to afford to live in a city like Beaverton. And with the average rent and having to work over 60 hours a week at minimum wage to afford an apartment, it's not a livable place. You know, I talk to community members all the time that are forced to leave Washington County to move further towards the coast to be able to afford to operate and live here, but they're still commuting in and they're still working here. So we're importing people to work in our community and asking them to leave at the end of the day. And then what does that do for our schools? How does that, you know, diversify our schools if we're continually moving and moving people around? House Bill 2001 that was passed was really aimed at the missing middle housing and really looking at how do we make housing more affordable. Um, and communities like mine were built with subdivisions that have um, you know, homeowners associations that won't allow ADUs and granny flats or uh, cottage housing. And we really have to look at housing through the lens, not only of affordability, but it really does create generational wealth. So what are we doing to get people into housing so they can afford to get into other housings? One of the projects I've been really working on at the city is really looking at how can we condoize some apartment buildings for affordable housing to be able to have people to be, able, you know, a condo that used to be an apartment probably could be purchased for 125 to 150,000. It's really easy to get it into a place like that. And how do we help people with down payments? I'm incredibly lucky that I served in the United States Army and was able to purchase my home through the Montgomery GI Bill, which didn't require me to put a down payment and it didn't require me to pay mortgage insurance. And we know that expansion after World War II that created the Montgomery GI Bill was the most prosperous in US history. And it opened up way more people to be able to afford a housing. So how do we look at a government program to that for everyday people so they can buy houses? And I know uh, Commissioner Fye has been working on this issue um, well before she was elected. So I'm sure she has some thoughts on it as well. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with you, you know, like the, the lack of affordable housing with the pandemic and the lack of childcare in Washington County, I've been like really struggling, you know, how a lot of families are struggling um, in, in our county. 
and now as a, a for you know housing authority director and and Washington County Commissioner board member, you know I see the need of affordable housing and 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 know that Washington County um, will be a key leader during this crisis to develop and manage affordable housing and administer uh, you know this really exciting uh, uh, funding that's coming in around supportive housing services from that measure and address the needs of people experiencing houselessness in our community. The regional affordable housing bond that passed um, followed by the supporting housing services uh, measure in 2020 you know, both measures uh, were passed by voters, um, and I think it's going to be really uh, going to bring in and alleviate a lot of, um, um, you know, deficits in our community, especially uh, folks who are disproportionately impacted in our community, uh, the Black and Indigenous and people of color and low-income communities. Um, as many of you know, Washington County is going to receive a lot of millions. <laughs> I forget the number. Uh, in uh, from the Metro Affordable Housing Bond, uh, and that money will, will be to develop, I think, over 800 units of affordable housing across the county. And and I think a lot of, um, I think, I don't know if many of you know, the Tigard, uh, the Viewfinder project in Tigard has already broken ground, and that along will provide 81 affordable homes and, and there's many, uh, you know, I've been having conversation with our staff and learning more a lot of the uh, many of the projects that are in um, in the pipeline uh, and Washington County uh, will, you know, it's trying to really be on track to exceed all the goals uh, set by Metro, including the number of family sized uh, units. Um, in terms of like the supportive housing services, uh, some of that money um, uh, for supporting housing service measure, uh, the funding will be available July 1 of, of this year. And right now staff uh, in Washington County are uh, re you know, reviewing proposals from service providers, many whom are culturally specific uh, service providers uh, to determine the best use of these funds. Uh, and these funds will support folks experiencing homelessness with services that wrap around each individual um, to provide stability and health uh, while also providing services for those experiencing uh, um, houselessness uh, briefly uh, and to ensure they are able to you know, um, swiftly transition back into housing and receive much needed services. Um, so I don't, I think um, while both of these funds that I mentioned um, will provide much needed resources to address housing affordability in the region, there's still much more that needs to be done and resources will continue to be in need for Washington County as we work to increase housing equity, equity in our community. So I, I really want to uh, let people who are listening on or who watch this later, you know, to know that I value community feedback as we continue to do this work and to help understand what the barriers are as house, you know, for uh, housing stability. Uh, what is the biggest need, housing needs in our community, and uh, how do we best address uh, uh, these needs and remove barriers? Because I really do believe. People who are closest to the problem are also closest to the solution, and we need to facilitate uh, that kind of collaboration and, and partnership. And I think what's important to mention uh, to kind of echo off Commissioner Fai, right? Like we're seeing some of these affordable housing projects go up. The cities, we're in our third of our fourth uh, Metro bond. We're the fastest out of the gate. We're going to complete all four. We're going to be selfish and try to go back for some of those excess funds because we've been talking about affordable housing for a long time. But for perspective, we're over 15,000 doors short of affordable housing in Washington County. So even though we have three buildings that are going to be in the five, 600, you know, range total, I mean, it, it is a drop in the bucket. 
And that was a massive bond effort to get that. And not to say that it's not worth the effort, it's totally worth the effort. But we have so much work to do in this area and we're just kind of going at it a little by little. But I think from like a, a, a city perspective and a county perspective, we've not really looked at housing as a spectrum either, right? We've not looked at how people are going to age in place gracefully. My mom lives in a three bedroom house in Beaverton because she can't afford to live in an apartment because the mortgage is cheaper. But that is a house that a young family could afford. And if we had something, you know, like cottage housing or something smaller my mom could move into where it didn't cost her her retirement to do it, we could start opening up some of these housings where families at. You know, Central Beaverton, where I've lived the majority of the time I've been here, I would say it's mostly older women living by themselves. All five of our neighbors are widowed women. And so we've not really done that next phase as people are aging in our system. And if you spent your life here and you raised your family here and you've worked here, you should be able to retire here too. And so we need to look a little bit, um, not just about building more, which of course we do, but how do we look at our, our housing as a spectrum to figure out where some of the gap and need analysis are? That is such a critical um, point. And, you know, I think of my own mother, as you say it, she's got a large house. She's ambulatory, but not able to walk up the stairs. And there's a full floor that a family could easily be in. And yet she's concerned about having strangers in her house. And, um, you know, she doesn't feel like a landlord and she doesn't want to deal with the taxes and all that. So I think that there are so many ways that we can create housing and partnerships, you know, for it's not just the housing um, sharing, but also the yard work and the um, just looking out for our aging population as they are alone in these populations. I see the people who fall and have a hip fracture and have critical um, repercussions as a result. And, and we could avoid that if we really get to community partnership in a meaningful way at, on the micro local level. And I know that that's what a lot of our community members are doing um, within their, um, their own friends and neighbors, but I think we can do it in a fundamentally organized way. We just have to think creatively and outside of the box. And I have great confidence in um, Representative Fahey. She's been an amazing leader at the state level and she's our um, house health housing chair. She really is thinking about this in a holistic way. And yet we still have so many barriers to getting through, you know, whether it's the, the permitting or the um, the development land like Washington County, I, I would love to understand Commissioner Fi, your thoughts around unincorporated Washington County and the lack of space that we've reserved, not just for housing, but for schools and outdoor spaces. And luckily with THPRD, they've um, protected some of that, but where are we going to put these um, units if we do build, you, you know, if we want to have cottage um, systems or do we just put them in backyards everywhere and figure out how to permit that and, and offer that as a community. I, I think that we need to continue to be aspirational and creative and um, not let all of the different layers of bureaucracy get in our way. And yet I say that knowing that that really is the huge barrier that we're going to have to overcome is figuring out all the different pockets and how to facilitate um, mobilizing them. Yeah, I, I think I'm um... My district includes also um, all of Aloha and Cooper Mountain and, and Reedville area, which are, are unincorporated areas of Washington County and then two thirds of the Beaverton city. Uh, so it's, a, it's always an interesting dynamic. And what you bring up is, you know, uh, housing supply versus demand. And then, and then there's also this political conversation about density versus build out and uh, the UGB and, uh, but in terms of like to hone in on this um, supporting housing services specifically and what we can do, I think there's a creative way, as you said, to borrow your words, um, to think about how we can do. There are a lot of um, empty, um, you know, redevelopable lands and opportunities that we can utilize. I think now what Washington County uh, and Hillsborough did with the Econ Lodge and, the, and then also the Aloha Quality Inn, um, it's also a creative way of looking at uh, um, empty uh, spaces that we can redevelop without starting from scratch uh, to house people. 
And so I think those are some of the creative ways. And um, and and also, you know, I, I if we're gonna house people who are um, experiencing houselessness, uh, we need to think about the infrastructure, you know, and to make sure that people are close with services that they need and 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 transportation to get from and to work and uh, so um, not to put people in somewhere far away that has uh, uh, the support that people need in order to uh, be uplifted out of uh, uh, homelessness and uh, housing instability. Uh, so I think it's a it's a long longer conversation uh, around what do we do and how. Uh, but it really takes, you know, as the elected officials to really ask uh, uh, staff who are um, the brains and the, you know, the machines behind all this to say, go back and look at another solution. And then to also say, go back and give me another solution. I think that that's what people are elected us to keep pushing our staff and to not take the first answer and you know, I'm learning that as a new elected um, to say, you know, when we have a concern from the constituents uh, to say, well, could we have provided a different answer? And I think when it comes to houses, that's, we need to just be human and say, I'm not sure if I was homeless, this, this not, you know, 10 years, who knows where I will be. And if, it might, if I'm in a severe situation, then I may not be alive to flourish and to take, a, take, a, take advantage of that opportunity. So I think uh, as elected official, we need to just um, really just be the devil's advocate and, and not in that sense, but in the sense of like embodying this um, um, idea that these are my people, you know, they're my families too. You know, they elected me to advocate for them. Therefore, they're in my care. Uh, and then to keep asking that creative answer. And it may not be the, you know, it might take few courageous conversations and a lot of pushback, but eventually we will get to that. Um, and, and, and to avoid that, you know, usually it's like we take something quickly and then we realize that that doesn't work for the communities that we're trying to service. And a lot of that is also because they're missing at the table. So us who got invited into this space uh, to create more space to um, invite the voices that are missing, even if I think I'm in a care, you know, I've lived in low income housing myself and I'm now a homeowner. I'm really passionate about uplifting people out of poverty through home ownership and increasing that opportunity. Um, but, you know, I, I should not be the only voice at that table. There are better voices who are currently in that situation and would like to tell us what is the best pathway out of poverty right at this moment. Because back then things have changed. We've experienced pandemics. So, um, so those are, I will say, and I think um, Mayor Beattie, um, unless you wanna add more, I'll stop right there. No, thank you. And I just wanna drop a couple numbers here. So in Washington County, the average is between 40 and 50% of income per family is spent on housing. And median income or median housing cost um, went up twelve thousand dollars in a month in Multnomah County last month. Um, so we are up at a median house cost of five hundred thousand dollars now. Um, we are people are buying property, but not the people who already who have never had access to that um, generational wealth, which really is the critical element of home ownership is that you have that security and, and it, you can pass down that security. So fundamentally, I'm completely there with you, Commissioner Fai, like we have got to figure out how to get families into ownership. And we have to give transitional supports for our most impoverished um, people. And I see, you know, the folks who have substance use disorder and, and housing insecurity who qualify for services, and yet they aren't able to access them just because there's so many other social pressures on them that they don't have the ability um, to just navigate a very 
tough system. And so we have to make it um, accessible to people. Um, Rep Fahey has said, we have more money than we probably are getting with $2 billion, enough money to close the gap on housing. And yet the question is, can we access those funds in a way that actually gets to where they need to be? And I think that is exactly what we all are here to do is to lean in and, and break down these barriers um, to access. With that, I, unless Mayor Beatty, you have anything to add, I think I'd like to ask if anyone has questions. And so either put your hand up or jump in with them. I think there's a small enough group that just jumping in would be fine. And I'm really good at waiting a long time. So I'm gonna wait a little longer before I start. <laughs> pressure, pressure. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and, and, and while people are getting, um, getting comfortable and muting, sometimes it's hard to find the mute button. Um, you know, like just to stay on this track of home ownership that we just um, walked into. Um, you know, I, I feel like there's a really innovative way of doing facilitating that home ownership in a, in a magnitude that really we can see the impact within like few years. Um, but sometimes we have this idea of one size fits all and we apply that and it's not the same for every family. And we weave out a family that we could have helped because they were maybe $50 over the income requirement to qualify for those assistance to buy their home. So, I think it's a, I think, I don't know, um, it, is, it sounds like it's a bit messy and, and also a bit controversial to think about, you know, how do we relax some of those criteria to facilitate families who are just making a little bit over the income requirement. Uh, but the controversial piece is like, are you helping people who sh you shouldn't help? And I feel like there's a fine balance between helping those who are just barely off or and helping people who don't need help with uh, home ownership. So uh, that's something that I've been um, just sitting in since I got elected because I think um, uh, I've been, um, I've heard some communities, I, I think that's one of them wasn't about uh, home ownership, but it was about um, other services, social services such as food stamp. And they were specifically saying, you know, I'm, I think they said like, 35 or $40 over the mark uh, and they couldn't qualify, but his wife isn't working and he's the only one. And they have a house mortgage and they have a few uh, uh, children to feed and yet they couldn't qualify because they were just barely off the, so, and I've seen it. I, I know when I went through my own home ownership process, I faced that, uh, couldn't qualify. Um, you know, two, two sides of it. First time, um, you know, couldn't qualify enough money to buy a home where I needed because I was making less money. Um, and then when I got a second job, um, I was over the assistant level. So this is a real life true story and, and, and something that we can track because the requirements is you have to meet the 80% property income level. Um, but families who want to buy a home that is in the 300, they can't do that with one income that pays about 40 or 55,000 a year. You know, the bank won't give you enough money to. So uh, something to, for you, representative, and for you, Mayor Beanie, to think about how do we really look into the criteria around our home ownership assistance programs? I am going to put a plug in because obviously home ownership is ownership is what I a lot of us would see as the ideal um, and rental um, assistance is robustly available right now and a new website just opened up I think Peter just put it um, in the chat there the Oregon rental assistance.org um, more funds just became available yesterday um, they are retroactive um, I think going back to February Peter correct me if I'm wrong March um, of 2020 okay great thank you and um, there's also landlord assistance. So um, please do, for the rental assistance, go to OregonRentalAssistance.org. And, and we also have, um, I think you have uh, the landlord assistance 
information as well if you can drop that in too. But we have to stabilize people in the housing that they're in right now. We know it's far more expensive to rehouse than to maintain housing. And um, those dollars are with this new website, we're being told, and I hope that it's true that the the accessibility and, and the utilization or the usability of this website is much improved. And so I hope that people will make sure to share that out um, amongst their networks because a lot of folks are really hanging by a thread right now. Um, and luckily, you know, with the, the ARPA funds and other things, we will be making investments in, in shelters and um, housing supports and um, CB community based organizations to help facilitate people navigating these systems. But that all takes time and we need to make sure that we are urgently keeping people where they are and keeping them safe um, during this really unstable time in our, our history. And, and I just encourage I, you, oh, sorry, Mayor, go ahead. Just encourage you, Rep Dexter, to, to advocate for lifting up some of the income requirements on this. You have to be pretty low income to qualify for this rent assistance. And we know the average family cannot withstand a $500 expense without going into debt and borrowing it. And a lot of families are going to be make too much money to qualify for this and are going to be hit the hardest. And if we get them out of ho stable housing, it's going to cost a whole lot more to get them in stable housing. And really, you know, here in Washington County, where incomes are a, a bit higher, it's going to be very hard for our families here to qualify. They're not they're going to make way too much to qualify for this. So I know it is being seen as as the savior program, but this is not going to really impact our Washington County families. No, it's an interesting point. There is a huge disparity in Washington County. Um, you know, we have one of the, I think it is the highest um, zip code earner in the Bethany area in the state and um, some of the lowest income with the most diverse um, communities. So we, what we are dealing with in Washington County is emblematic of what's happening in a lot of the um, state, not necessarily as um, rural, they're not as disconnected from the metropolitan resources, but just as effectively disconnected when you are a low income family without access to transportation and, and services, it, it feels in broadband, you know, there's so many things that we have really got to invest in to make um, not just housing, but a community that's um, really supportive and allows our families to thrive. And I think that's what we're all here to do. So I, I take that um, information. I certainly have had a couple to do items given to me by our uh, local leaders. Thank you so much. And, and I just wanna reassure people that there is a enormous amount of will and desire to do the right thing and yet we need to hear from our constituents. We need to hear from people to tell us what is it that you are having challenges with. We can really deal with the, the microcosm or the, the micro challenges if we hear about them. And at the state level, like I just don't have line of sight to all of that. So we are trying to bring stakeholders meaningfully to the table and, and paying people to, to engage in, in different discussions groups and whatnot, but really what matters most is that I get to hear what your experience is and then learn from that and, and apply it to other communities. So please keep um, communicating. Please email all of us when you feel inclined to do so, but I know that all of us are very accessible and, and deeply committed to doing what we can for our working families um, throughout Washington County. And with that, I think we are at closure. Um, so I thank you so much, Mayor Beatty and Commissioner Fye and Chair Harrington and Alfredo, our newest um, THPRD counselor. And I think we lost um, Lori, um, Commissioner Traeger, but um, I would really love to continue this conversation in the future. So let's uh, reconnect in the not too distant future and see how things are going. Thanks so much.